All right, it is Thursday, April 6th, 2023, and I'm uh, joined here by Michael Steenbeck Litvin. Thank you so much for joining me. This is a state of human design. Take two. <laughs> yeah. We recorded uh, earlier, or so we thought, but uh, sometimes that happens. So, yeah, so I'm just here at the Center for Human Design First Order of News. It's now listed in uh, Google Maps. So if you look in Google Maps and type in Center for Human Design, you actually find this location right here. Mm. Um, That's one level of the Maya. <laughs> yeah, getting into Google Maps, getting into Wikipedia is next. Yeah. That's a little bit denser Maya, harder to get into. And we're actually in the, um, the library room for the Santa Fe Human Design Library. Mm. So very excited uh, to, be, to be working on that. So, okay, I have some big news. The High Desert Human Design Conference is September 13th to 17th this year, mm -hmm. September 13th to 17th, 2023, and uh, I will be launching the website shortly at highdeserthumandesign.com, so check there for information. We'll be updating the um, lineup as we get confirmations and as things shuffle around, and really excited. It's going to be, we have some really positive changes for this year. Mm. One of the interesting things is um, Richard Rudd wrote seven years. Um, he wrote basically a seven-year deconditioning guide. Mm -hmm. Seven years on the wheel of passage, it's called. Mm -hmm. And he talks about each year of deconditioning. And your first year is marked by gate three, trouble at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then your second year, it's a very educational year. The third year is the year of alignment, I believe, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've kind of seen... How, the, how everything follows the seven-year cycle. Mm. The High Desert Human Design Conference is no different. There you go. And we have our alignment venue this year. We have a venue you wanted last year, to, what, didn't you? Yeah, to absolutely. We yeah. tried to get it, yeah. and we, we weren't able to, and so now we're actually getting the venue. Not that the last year's venue had any problems. We, we all liked it, but this venue is much cozier and more mystical, and um, it's the Oddfellows Hall cool. in Santa Fe. So. Santa Fe's premier uh, dance venue for, you know, line dancing and mm -hmm. contra dancing and things like that. Hardwood floors, really good acoustics, and um, hand-carved benches, and it's, it's going to be really nice. Kind of surrounded by a graveyard, isn't it? It is next to a graveyard, yes. Cool. So we're, we are among the spirits, but it's in a really good location, kind of south rail yard, and uh, very close to the new Iconic that just opened close to Counterculture, where we held some events last year, and uh, I'm just really excited about it. It's a video I'm really excited about. So, okay, we have a few, um, I'm actually just gonna grab this here so I can get it ready. So, Raven is talking about human design on TikTok. Yes, Raven of That's So Raven posted a TikTok uh, in which she apparently got a really good reading, it really resonated with her, and she was just, um, she found out a lot about herself. She looked at her chart and said, that's so Raven, you know? <laughs> but, but anyway, you know, and uh, so my big takeaway from that moment was realizing how many uh, new people must have been introduced to human design through Raven going on TikTok and talking about human design because when you go to the comments, all the comments are people saying like, I don't understand what you're saying. What is this, huh? What, whatever, you know? Where, um, where, and that's how, how you te can tell that a mutation has reached new territory when it's not people saying like, oh, I fucked with that, it's interesting, or like, oh, I'm this, I've learned about that, whatever. But when people are just totally like baffled, then that tells you you're breaking into new terrain, socially. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, the, the confusion is really a good yardstick of, yeah. these are all completely newcomers to human design, I've never heard of it before. Right. And so it really is bringing, and I, I didn't know who Raven is. You mentioned Raven was a, kind of a celebrity from Disney Channel. Something like that, yeah. In the early 2000s, and who is, who is kind of now a um, TikTok personality, I guess, or? Right, right, right. Yeah, she, so she must be, um, I don't know, probably about your age or whatever, but she's always had this like very sort of like zeitgeisty contemporary streak, like post her sitcom. Like every once in a while she just pops up in the news saying something like kind of quirky and interesting and relevant and whatever. I don't really, obviously don't follow her life very closely, but I get the impression that she always kind of knows what's going on. So it's cool that she's 
it makes sense also that she would be hip to human design. But in any case, it's like the highest tier of celebrity to even mention human design since Alanis Morissette wore that shirt yeah. on stage right? last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is, it's exciting. And uh, you said she's a fairly individuated person who seems to be kind of... She always seems like herself. Yeah, yeah. Seems, seems to really yeah. be um, a differentiated individual and so on. Well, very cool. Um, okay, next I want to share something about the G Center that I just thought was really interesting and cool. This is a graphic here. Um, this was shared by Jan van Denberg. And Jan, uh, for those who came to the HDHD conference last year and got the guidebook, know that um, we um, kind of you know, elected Jan the person of the year for human design mm -hmm. and because he's really... Um, he contributes so much. And this is just from Ra from Rave Anatomy 2. The G center is a binary, two different ways held together by the monopole, causing evolving movement from the beginning. The monopole holds these parts together, and, and, and what we get to see is the G center, the expression of the identity of the Meyer, Maya itself. Excuse me. Uh, it's a little bit, it's been transcribed, so. Let me just try that again. The monopole holds these parts together, out of which we get to see the G center, the expression of the identity of the Maya itself. It gives the Maya its direction, but it cannot control the holistic frequency. The frequency is a self-reflected consciousness. Since 1781, we have to establish this new identity, realizing that there is a consciousness that is actually there to be able to take care different from this homogenizing binary consciousness as a decision-making entity. Operating according to, your, according to your inner authority, it's the first step to recognize this new consciousness, to be able to go through this next evolutionary process. The personality of the Neanderthal was just aligned to the natural order, simply passive. The seven-centered personality with its strategic development was looking for taking control of the life itself. We are here as personalities to observe. It is the last chance for personalities to observe, to fulfill the potential of what it is to be a passenger. So I just want to share this again. And it was just really an interesting uh, quote, and it was something that I really liked with the graphic as well, which is showing um, the right spin and the left spin in the G-Center kind of divided down the middle as this... I mean, we always say the G-Center, the magnetic monopole in the G-Center is what holds us together in the illusion of our separateness. But it's really nice to see it as a graphic of kind of the binary. And you actually have the love and the direction. Um, there, I'll, I'll kind of line it up so the reflection of the circle is right on the G-Center. But anyway, it's a spin. And it's just nice to see um, there's two spins, really. It's one spin going one direction and one going the other. Mm -hmm. And the love gate's going in one direction. And the, the direction gate's going in the other. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of liked that. And it was definitely... Um, an interesting post and then Shango Child commented the scheme and opposite spinnings remind me of Metatron Merkaba was cool. her comment and then we had a follow-up from Angela Flack uh, who wrote do you know when Ra is saying right spin is that the perspective from front on um, and Angela mentioned she does energy work and has found that adjusting her chest to the right at the bottom and looking downwards adjusts from hate into love. And she says she has 25 and 46 defined unconsciously and split from conscious definition. And it's almost like you can look down and see the 25 and that 46. Mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. It's an interesting question. Jan said, great question. The text is Rave Anatomy 2, but there isn't talk about direction. Also, the juxtaposition theory has this spinning expressed without talking about experience. Having the right angle cross of the Sphinx, Jan says about himself, when he's in the flow, it goes, seeing him frontwise to the right, but in, her own ex in his own experience to the left. So mm. he's saying that he kind of notices a spin predominantly to the left. Mm. So very interesting, very intriguing. Um, just kind of any energy workers out there, feel free to comment if you notice the G-Center spinning. Um, something I, I had thought of was C.W. Ledbetter, the great theosophical researcher, theosopher. Who, and uh, clairvoyant. And clairvoyant as well, exactly. And I think he even, didn't he discover Jiddu Krishnamurti? I'm pretty sure he No, was. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think he, did, he met Jiddu Krishnamurti as a young boy, kind of 
discovered him as the, the one who would um, eventually become the head of the Theosophical Society and would eventually disband the Theosophical Society. Um, but in any case, Ledbetter has this wonderful book on the chakras. And uh, in fact, I might as well. Why not? It's, not? it's here in the Human Design Library. We have it. Cool. And uh, this is just a fantastic book on the chakras. And it actually has wonderful images of the chakras. These full color, you know, this is the crown chakra or the head for us. And so really cool, beautiful images. And um, I remember just really enjoying this book when I was a teenager and learning all about the chakras. And uh, I think it's wonderful that just to kind of think about the chakras as spinning, you know, these spinning wheels. Mm -hmm. And, um, Chakra means wheel. Right, exactly, exactly. And here is the seven-centered being, for those who ask for a seven-centered body graph. That's, That's as close as you're going to get. Yeah, this is about all we got here. So, uh, Okay, so Power View Press. Okay. Uh, they're doing good work. They're yes. Doing, they're doing something unique, distinct, uh, both visually and content-wise. Um, it's, it's an Instagram magazine. Right, so it's, uh, you said it's monthly? I didn't even realize. Yeah, that. on the first of the month, and um, or just about the first of the month. And they post, it's a digest, it has a bunch of interesting stories and quips and takes, and it just, it just looks like a lot of care went into it. It's a nice yeah. piece of work. So check out Instagram, Power View Press. Um, I was first introduced to them when they posted Not Self Bingo, which was you kind of uh, mark and bingo for different things you've experienced, and you know, one was... Um, Jonah takes a breath, or you know, waiting for Jonah to take a breath. That's so that your not self. Oh no, they're no. Not self it's if just kind of. You to... I think they're just a joke. It's really That's just a bingo. They made a human design bingo, basically, mm -hmm. and their human design bingo is all about, um, you know, things that you can see in the world of human design. So. All right, and so they uh, they posted their in and out list. Moving to Santa Fe is out. Oh yeah. So. Well, what can Oops. you do? <laughs> what can you do exactly? <laughs> All right, so this was in the news recently. An open letter, pause giant AI experiments. Um, oh, right, right. And we call on all AI labs yeah, yeah. to immediately pause for at least six months the training of AI systems more powerful than GPT-4. What's there to say about this one? <laughs> <laughs> Karen Curry Parker <laughs> is releasing videos with the sound frequency of various centers. Uh -huh. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, That's much cooler thing. than the AI thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so good job, KCP. Good research. Excited yeah. to, uh, yeah, and I know that um, you'd mentioned earlier that um, that there have been sound frequencies of different chakras. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. And, um, and actually, there's someone here in Santa Fe who does the sound frequencies of different planets mm. that are resonant to the resonant frequencies of the planets, and they have gongs, and they kind of have a Saturn gong, and mm. a Sun gong, and a Moon, and a Jupiter, and... And so on, and yeah. Yeah, and you said that what she's doing is kind of like binaural beats or something. Mm -hmm. And um, and with binaural beats, those have to work because you like, uh, uh, or for, for them to work, you have to like have headphones on, right? Because they really have to be in each ear, mm -hmm. right? Um, another good way to like really feel a chakra through sound is if you know what the frequency is or whatever, to just get a bunch of people to hum it and really dome up, you know, really make a little huddle mm. or whatever. Like, you, you'll feel it in that place in your body, for sure. I see. When you make a resonant frequency that actually vibrates that part of the body. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. So this was an interesting one. Search for a major depression trigger reveals a common amino acid, glycine, that can deliver a slowdown signal to the brain, likely helping alleviate major depression, anxiety, and other mood disorders. Mm. So that's glycine. Mm. And... Uh, I did a little research on this with my first line here, and what I found was that it's the gates of harmonia, or harmonia, how do you say it? Mm -hmm. Harmonia, yeah. Yeah. Harmonia. yeah, and so it's these four gates, um, gate 40, gate 64, gate 47, and gate 6. Right. And so these gates somehow produce the amino acid that tell the brain to slow down. And so it's interesting, anxiety and depression then being that the brain's moving too fast. Right. And, it, and in moving too fast, it is, it, you know, the person seems very slow, mm -hmm. but 
they're because that's kind of the idea. Usually, you'd see somebody depressed; they seem like they're a bit slow and lethargic, mm-hmm. but actually, their their brain is working way sure, too sure, quickly. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, they're jumping to conclusions. They're going through. So did you have any comments on this? I mean, 40, 64, 47, and 6. Um, yeah, that's peculiar. Obviously, 64 and 47 form a channel. Is, is it the only channel for, that could potentially be formed by a conjunction? Like or a, a conjunction that close? By adjacent gates, a, yeah. A two-degree two conjunction? Yeah, it's kind of weird. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if that is. But yeah, so it's... You had some good insights about gate 40 with this. Yeah, that 40 is the gate of aloneness and that um, there was a great quote that it was, um, I'm not sure who said it actually, but it was, the only cure for loneliness is aloneness. It may mm-hmm. have been James Hillman or he may have been paraphrasing a kind of a Middle Ages uh, maxim. And um, yeah, and um, basically that, that 40 having to do with aloneness is very much, I mean, it's a question of if you don't have enough of this amino acid produced, do you have a hard time being alone? Mm-hmm. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other comments I had, um, and so it's so funny because we, we recorded this earlier, so it's kind of like trying to remember back what were some of the, the nuggets of the conversation. I was thinking of um, von Franz, you know, Jung's great disciple, who said a couple things. She said, uh, Depression always covers greed, so it's a cover for greed, and that's an interesting one too. Is kind of its its relation to the ego, mm. um, that the person who appears to be depressed is really um, greedy for what could have been and what should have been. Mm. And the other thing is that she mentioned is that it, depression is really a cover for anger, and I think that's also in the line with with Melanie Klein, the object relations psychologist, who saw anger and depression as the withdrawn and sort of active state of the same emotion. Hmm. So I don't know that anger relates to any of these channels. It doesn't really, because what we have is um, two projected channels and a generator channel. So mm-hmm. it would be more about frustration mm-hmm. frustration and bitterness in that sense. But um, yeah, and then what you were saying also was that um, it's all in Virgo. Oh, right. Yeah. And so being a busy bee, being a busy Virgo bee in some sense may alleviate depression or yeah i mean it's an interesting idea keeping the feelings at bay through all your little tasks yeah yeah and it's interesting too to see what what body parts these relate to so gate 40 is the stomach uh 64 is the pineal gland so anything that works in the pineal gland like for instance how psychedelic mushrooms have been used in depression treatments and they work on the pineal gland theoretically Mm -hmm. Uh, the neocortex as well that's gate 47 and the lumbar ganglia which is associated with um, Eight, six. Hmm. So yeah, just an interesting interesting thing again. I'll just share this graphic again. And these are just the four gates that are thought to um, have some relationship to depression because they produce the amino acid glycine, which is the slow down, you know, slowing down and being able to slow down the brain and get the brain to kind of slow might actually make the person appear a little more lively, interestingly. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's kind of funny. It's a little backwards in that regard. And one other amplification just of the harmonia thing, like just at a base structural level, it's the duality part of duality. Or it's the base four part of base four, right? So it's double base. Harmonia is base four and then base four again. Basically, ah, right? I didn't realize that. Right. It's So that's a little dark, right? And that's a little um, uh, severe in its own way. That each because each one of these gates is like ha- begins with base four, base four, and then it's the four four permutations of that. Oh, right? and actually, sixty four is the base four, base four, base right, four, right. meaning it's yin yang, yin yang, yin yang. Yes. So it's, it really is the ultimate of that diagram. And what obvi- and one of the permanently unknowable energies to us as humans, sixty four and sixty three, will never be. Yeah, they're kind of outside of human experience, and they're they're a little bit outside of. It's almost like the hexagrams really end at 61, and then they have one extra hexagram that's like after the end. Right. And then they have two more that are outside of after the end or something in some weird way. And they're called before completion and after completion. Yeah. Which is such a... I love the I Ching. So, all right, Twitter update, Discord update. Anything new on that front? Uh, Twitter, business as usual. Human design occasionally reaches these new plateaus where new waves of people are talking about it. And with that comes, obviously, a very 
wonderful, welcome um, diversity of perspective as more and more like different kinds of people take their eyes and their intellects to it and apply it to their lives. And so from that, you know, beginner's mind, you also got get a lot of like new insights, you know, and the, the field is becoming more differentiated, you know, through that. But then you also get more homogenization. You get the opposite. You get people that are not really applying it to their own experience or are doing so very superficially and are sort of turning human design into a commodity and starting to say things before they, before it means anything to them, you know, and so you get this cheapening, this flattening of what human design could really actually offer people. You get everyone using human design language to do something other than practice human design, mm -hmm. which is always sad. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I know um, something I think about a lot is just what we're doing with the language we're using. And I kind of just had a oh, point, yeah. which is, yeah. Are we going to do this whole conversation? It doesn't have to be the whole conversation. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, earlier we had this whole long conversation that was really in-depth and detailed, and then it wasn't recording. So, so we're just going to do the short version of it, which is just uh, people have heard me talk about Dave Chalmers. He talks about verbal disputes, and a verbal dispute is any argument or disagreement where you can change the words being used, and there's no longer a disagreement. Mm -hmm. And so all I wanted to say is, when we get into some of the tangles of human design language and what it's used for, for me it's just very important to keep in mind that all we're really trying to do is wake people up, or to get them to live their design, mm -hmm. or get them to experiment with their design in some way. Mm -hmm. And so I may try to explain what a projector is like mm -hmm. or what a generator is like or what happens when this happens or that happens and I have all these anecdotes and stories. But then people will say, that, well, they find counter examples or they mm -hmm. find counter stories or they say, well, is a projector really like that? Or yeah. is a generator really like that? Or do we really have to do this? Or, and ultimately, I guess what I'm saying is I, I mostly will just concede, no, you don't really have to. And no, it's not really like that because we're talking about words and words really aren't things to say is this word really that is a projector really this word mm -hmm. no a projector is a type and you can only really learn about that type from experiencing that type and witnessing that type mm -hmm. and you may have a different characterization of that type than i do or anyone mm -hmm. else does and you may have a different characterization of what that's like but i guess i'm just trying to say um you know i'm not really in the business of arguing over what things really are mm -hmm. i'm in the business of trying to teach and trying to communicate and trying to wake people up. And I really liked uh, the Pura Vida Costa Rica event because Alokanand Diaz was such a master. I mean, he's a color for motivation need, mm -hmm. which is the master. And he was able to express what the room needed to hear, what people needed to hear. They would ask him questions and he wouldn't really answer their question. He would use his own judgment to demonstrate the mechanics and how he answered and I think you would learn so much more through osmosis and through witnessing that than you do from trying to argue over the truth of something. It's mm -hmm. like the two forms of truth. There's linguistic truth, and then there's the truth of reality. And mm -hmm. anything that, what we're trying to get people to do is get a U-turn to stop facing the mind and facing the mind direction, mm -hmm. but to turn around and start facing the reality. Mm -hmm. And so when they're asking questions like, what is it like when two projectors meet each other? What is this like? What is that like? They're still looking in the mind realm. Right. And what we're trying to do, and what Alok was so masterful <laughs> at, was getting them to do a U-turn and face yeah. the other direction. And so that's just my only point there, is just, when we get into the realm of language, there's a real question of, is this really that word? And no, yeah. words aren't really things. Words are indicators that help us convey and hopefully facilitate or cultivate certain attitudes that um, put you in touch with, with you know, reality. And that's, that's really what it's about. So, Okay, so uh, a couple more interesting stories here. Um, we can get through these kind of quick. Just neutrino stories. So we've discovered neutrinos from particle colliders now. This was just um, last week. Hmm. And uh, so particle colliders are now outputting neutrinos, which is great. Um, I thought they were before, but actually we had neutrino observatory labs, but those were observing neutrinos from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And these are actually creating neutrinos through particle smashing. Wow. So that's pretty neat. And there's a little point here. It said every second about 100 billion neutrinos pass through each square centimeter of your body. So I thought that was pretty cool. 
And then in other neutrino news, neutrino particles are now blasting out of a nearby galaxy, and scientists aren't sure why. The spiral galaxy NGC 1068, also known as the Squid Galaxy, is a bustling Disneyland of neutrino production. Hmm. And so, um, but yeah, it's just interesting that there's just more neutrino news. We're finding more about neutrinos. Ra, of course, predicted that neutrinos had mass a number of years, uh, around seven years before it was proven by science. Hmm. And uh, he's changed his hat. Right. Yeah, when, when they found out they had mass. Yeah. He took off his shaman hat and put on a baseball cap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a couple more. We just have, um, this is from Justin Nunyabid. And he said he had an inspired thought. What if the color change from life to life, like how our color, you know, I'm color three, you're color three, mm -hmm. we go different colors. What if the color change is literally due to each lifetime involving dying correctly and not dying correctly? Is it possible that your original Godhead can pick you back up if you die correctly the next time around, even if you didn't the time before? Mm. And this is from comments that Ra made about, you know, he was color three, ghosts. Mm. And he said color one, two, and three came from rogue crystal bundles. Crazy. And so that's an interesting idea, something kind of I hadn't really encountered before, mm. was that this idea that, uh, you know, your previous incarnation was either from a Godhead or was from a rogue crystal bundle, mm. depending on your personality color. Mm -hmm. and maybe it changes mm -hmm. so yeah that is mysterious there's also that thing about the color one two three encounters the the entities that you meet from those rogue bundles being smaller than a person right and four five and six are not so that's right just that's an interesting point yeah there that yeah and that there is a big difference between those colors for sure so um okay and then the last comment here because and, the yeah. rogue bundles do hold far, far fewer crystals than the primary godheads, right? Right. The godheads are just holding just billions and trillions of right. crystals. Potential lives, yeah. 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 Okay, and this is from Alex Make Love. Jonah, have you come across Ian McGilchrist's work on left or in right brain? Monumental work, particularly his book, The Master and His Emissary, but lots of great interviews on YouTube. McGilchrist's model is so resonant with Ra's work on left and right brain. Hmm. So I haven't, but thank you for sending that, and definitely interested. Um, yeah, I mean, I've definitely heard about left brain, right brain, but I haven't studied it uh, and kind of where it came from. And so Ian McGilchrist. And then an update. Neutrino Design now has transit notifications. Yay! Making it the first app to do so. That's which is, huge. Which is really exciting. Uh, I've, I've wanted that for a long time, and that what that means is you can actually tell it to notify you on your phone when any planet goes through gate 25 or For any sure. planet goes through gate 59. or mm -hmm. You can kind of have it tell you and kind of alert. Um, and you can also have it, you know, alert when certain planets go in certain positions and so on, I, I believe. But yeah, getting activation notification is huge. Mm -hmm. And even just for observing the transits, like how cool is it to just get notified and just kind of have real-time notification. Oh, the sun just moved into a new line. Lovely. Oh, this moved into a new gate. Great so, for the moon. Absolutely. So, very excited about that. All right, any parting shots, parting ideas? Anything, Anything that we covered last time that you want to make sure we include again? Um, I talked a little about Francois Laruelle, but that's kind of it's, its own topic. <laughs> I think it was a time and a place. but um, It was related to the, uh, the language thing. Yeah, and just, you know, Francois Laruelle is a brilliant philosopher who um, says that thought should be determined in the last instance unilaterally by the real. Cool. Which means that essentially that the mind and the role of thought in the mind should only determine, be determined kind of one directionally mm. by reality. And uh, he was really against conceptual bloating. Mm. And I mean, he is, he's you know, still alive. And he's very non -philosophy. much philosophy. Yeah, right. He's the founder of non philosophy, and um, is very much about um, using thought. You know, he's against philosophy because philosophy, even though he's doing philosophy, but the kind of philosophy he's doing, he calls non philosophy, because philosophy has this um, sort of superiority complex of the mind that the mind can philosophize anything. Mm -hmm. And his point is, you know, for a philosopher to talk about photography. Why do they think that they get the final say of photography and mm -hmm. not the, the 
photographers themselves mm -hmm. or for mm -hmm. a philosopher to talk about comics, why would they have the final say and not the comics artists and right. people who are kind of at the peak of that particular field? Who are living it. Exactly, exactly. And ultimately, um, he's very much about the one directional determination of thought by the real, meaning that our thinking should be determined by reality and should not, it should not be this relativistic kind of two directional thing where um, the real occurs and then thought occurs and then they both gain equivalence to each other and mm -hmm. they're both able to equally have their say. He's like, no, actually only reality has its say. Right. And thought's role is to kind of be the slave to reality right. and to try its best. And this is kind of, I guess, just in the, the topic of what I'm doing when I'm trying to explain something or teach something or convey something is really just trying so many different approaches to appeal to the other person mm -hmm. to get them to wake up, yeah. to get them to turn back to the real, to yeah. get them to have a new, to have an event, to have a new perspective, to have mm -hmm. a new um, experiment they enter into, to get the virus through, you know, right. I'm trying to infect them with a logic virus. And if I fail this way, I'm going to try that way. And mm -hmm. if I fail that way, I'm going to try another way. And I'm just going to continually concede. So that if they say you're wrong, Jonah, I say, okay, I'm wrong. Now let's try another approach. Right. That approach was wrong because it didn't get through to you. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. And so I'll try another approach. And it's basically, that's kind of the La Ruelian um, ethos of instead of arguing, because then you just get in the mind realm of arguing whether this word really means that thing or whether this is true or false or whatever. Right. Um, as Slavoj Žižek says, philosophy begins when we stop asking what a word really means and start asking what you mean by that word mm -hmm. and what I mean by that word. Mm -hmm. Because then we're no longer saying... Is it really this? Is a projector really that way? Is a generator really like this? Is a manifesting generator really this or that? We're not really asking if any word really is anything. We're mm -hmm. simply saying, what do you mean when you say manifesting generator? Right. Oh, I see. You mean someone who has this configuration. What do you mean when you say someone's a projector? Okay, I see. What do you mean when you say they have to wait to be invited? Well, mm -hmm. let's understand this. Rather than asking, do they really have to wait to be invited? Mm -hmm. It's more about, if you don't understand what waiting to be invited is, try another way of explaining. Try another approach. Right. These are approaches to get you to understand something that's really going on in the real world. And it's not about the words we use. It's about getting people to change direction. So instead of facing the realm of the mind, they turn around and face the realm of the world. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as Alok said, which I love, um, his great answer when, when s someone asked a question that he didn't really have another answer for would be, well, that's a question that only experience can answer. Nice. So that's really good. Yeah, it's it's kind of like the words can never reach the real, and the words can never um, they can never inspire the actual change or the actual effect. But the way that they play off of circumstance, that's like how they do that redirection of reality to itself. It's like they like the the appropriate word at the right time or whatever can sort of inspire a person to lead themselves back to themselves. But mm. the, the word on its own is not going to do any of that. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah. I, I kind of think a lot about that, about how something that seems so profound at one phase of psychological development seems mundane and obvious at another level. Right. But then it might seem profound again later, and that it's really the, the context, and if, if one set of words doesn't work, try another. Instead of getting stuck on those and arguing about whether they're really this or that, it's, yeah. And because like you always say, it's mostly the aura doing the talking. So it's like, regardless of what kind of words you're attaching to it, it's like the aura is transmitting its message or not, and the words can basically assist you in being aware that that transmission is happening. And that's like when we talk about worlds building the Maya, the predominant thing that they do in the building of the Maya is naming things, in other words, pointing things out that are happening. Right, right. And if the names... It's kind of like uh, the Jung quote. He said, uh, God isn't dead. We've simply lost our symbol for him. Mm. You could say we've lost uh, our yeah. word for him. The word has lost meaning. And, um, you know, meaning is something that is that if somebody says something is meaningless, it's not that they don't understand the dictionary meaning. It's not like, oh, my life is, mean is you know, meaningless. Let's look in the dictionary yeah, of yeah. the meaning. No, it's <laughs> yeah. not about that. It's right. the meaning is something that uh, seems... Um, salient, it stands out from its, yeah, and sensible, and, and it's, 
And so, yeah, I mean, really, it's just, just keeping in mind that as we're working in the realm of human design and we're communicating with each other, that really the nine-centered communication is, yeah, it is ultimately um, the aura is going to do the talking, so the communication is there to get the mind out of the way to right. let the mechanics yeah. do the talking. And, and that's why you're never doing human design online, you know? You're never... Um, there without yeah. the somatic component there is no real sensibility to language that's something i got from berardi that i refer back to a lot that's superhuman design compatible mm. you know that there is no sensibility of language without the the aura in the mix or the body or whatever mm -hmm. that's a really good point yeah we can transmit information but we can't transmit um aura mechanics in the same way and we can't witness and experience certain dynamics and there's just certain things that are transmitted purely through the aura that right. uh, the words don't don't convey and why we have this obvious like um, loss of sense of meaning linked to too much virtualization or whatever mm -hmm. all the That's suffering that comes with being too online yeah. all right well i think we covered a lot of it sweet <laughs> <laughs> thanks for watching all <laughs> till next time